what's like the key thing looking back over the last couple of years where you realize, oh man, like the attitude I had towards this player or towards the game was just really not healthy. I just realized that I've, I've let so many comments slip out that are just shameful. I play so much better against the better players, or I know what to do against the better players. Like, it's so much easier. My guest today for this conversation is, we're going to call him Ben from England. And I'm really looking forward to this conversation because it, we're going to dive deep into a mental toughness topic that is near and dear to my heart. And I think it should be talked about more. Ben, ben and I were just discussing this off camera. Here's the gist. Let me just set this up really quickly. I created a video called The Worst Attitude in Tennis on my personal channel. I have a Ian Westerman a YouTube channel. And in that video, I talk about this contrast between how tennis players and coaches tend to really fixate on technique, how to swing the racket, how to have a better forehand, how to have a better serve. And tennis players over years and years of being saturated in that focus tend to view that as kind of the only lens that they view somebody's tennis ability. In other words, if somebody has a better forehand or a better serve, then they're a better tennis player. But the reality is, and we all know this, if we like just kind of broach the subject like very quickly, we all know this because we've all lost to somebody who has a worse forehand and a worse serve. So there must be much more to the game of tennis than just our technique, right? But tennis players tend to fixate on the technique and then get really condescending and judgmental about other players who are worse than them. So Ben reached out to me and sent a long email, which I'm just gonna read like two sentences of right now just to kick off the conversation. He wrote, here's from his uh, email. I just watched your video with the title, The Worst Attitude in Tennis. And I realized this is exactly what I am doing and I feel terrible about it. The self-realization has hit me hard, hence why I feel the need to reach out. My problem, where my ego, arrogance, and condescending attitude is so destructive, is in club training. So that's just like for context, I just wanted to kind of paint the picture here a little bit. My interactions uh, with Ben. Ben, how's it going? Number one, I just want to say I really respect you a lot for just leaving that comment, much less sending me the email, much less being willing to come on and have like an open conversation about it. Thank you for being, being willing to do that because I think it's a very prevalent issue in tennis in general. And I love creating content that helps people be a little bit more self-reflective and have a better, healthy, a healthier, more fulfilling relationship with themselves and with the game of tennis. Tennis teaches a lot of those lessons. So thank you for being here. Any thoughts, like big picture, as we kind of kick this off? Um, I think, thank you for having me for a start. Um, and thanks for making that video. Uh, my goal and my, my aim is that that helps me on my tennis journey. And um, I think it could help a lot of people. And the danger, if it's not addressed, is potentially that somebody is going to sooner or later fall out of love with tennis, which is a shame. And it would be better if that didn't happen, right? So I think it's something that we can all benefit from and, and I would happily help and also help myself in the process. So tell me a little bit about, uh, so paint, paint us a little picture of your experience in tennis. Uh, I believe you said in your email, you played from age 10 to 20. You took it mm -hmm. pretty seriously. Can you tell us a little bit about your background? Yeah, sure. I mean, uh, I grew up in England, just outside of London, and I became kind of a tennis tennis club kid at about the age of 10, where I just lived at the club. I was constantly having lessons, groups and individuals and fitness and everything else. Um, we did a lot of traveling, we did a lot of competing. Um, it was great, I loved it, you know, it was my, it was everything. I, I, I really enjoyed it. And um, I got kind of good, you know, like I, I was playing regularly and competing and you didn't really think much as a kid, you know, I just went with the flow and you, you know, you, you get on with it. Um, what happened then, I think, is uh, when I reflected back after watching your videos, that this topic was never really covered in my training, which was extensive, right? So, like, they had the opportunity to do so, but they didn't. We focused on things like technique and fitness and, and a little bit of strategy, you know, when to go cross and, and line and, and whatever else. But on bad days, I was not really that formidable, you know, I, I sort of crumbled. And on good days, I was hard to beat. So 
Um, I think the initial problem was was kind of grounded there in, in that period of time. Um, towards the end of my playing career, which which never really took off, um, I started to sort of help as a sparring partner, as a coach for the kids, um, where I had previously been attending the classes, you know, um, and became a bit of a coach and had a very nice um, straight back down the middle, nice feed to my clients and, and that sort of thing, you know. Um, and I think that also had a, a bit of an impact on me as an adult when I finally came back to the game. It was a it was a good break of 20 years. So after giving up around the age of 20, 21 at university, my life took many side turns and I've had many midlife crises since then, which I've loved. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and yeah, I decided to come back at about 40 years old and, and give it a shot. Okay, so what was the moment looking back that causes you to what was the word that you said uh you said you you feel terrible about it and you just have this self like realization looking back now at now that you've played tennis for a couple more years after jumping back mm -hmm. into it what's like the key thing looking back over the last couple of years where you realize oh man like the attitude i had towards this player or towards the game was just really not healthy I think um, for me, the, there was a point in the video where it, it was discussed about how like the fact that that person made you uncomfortable, he spent his, his time trying to make you uncomfortable. You know, like I don't train just with a coach or just with a ball machine. I'm varied in my training, my approach, and I'm, I'm trying to cover all the bases. But um, the, the idea that somebody else has just got this kind of like hanging in there for dear life until the last minute kind of attitude. And for me to have the audacity to then say after losing to that person, man, I, I've said it many times, I play so much better against the better players, or I know what to do against the better players. Like It's so much easier. And um, like I was kind of explaining at the level I was at as a kid, I was playing a lot of better players and I was taking deep runs in tournaments, you know, where they only got better and everybody came out swinging. No one had any second thought. Oh, do I push this back, play it safe, play this angle? No, no, it was all you know, smash it hard, top spin heavy and attack. Because you were 16, you know, what? you didn't know any different. So as an adult coming back, these players I'm playing, they're like, they've been playing these 20 years where I've been off gallivanting around the world doing all kinds of other things. And they know exactly how to win with whatever technique they held on to. And, and here's me coming in going, well, my technique's pretty great, but I don't know what to do with that shot with that funny spin on it and that weird bounce and what kind of angle is that? That's not what textbook says you should play in this situation you know so i'm sort of a bit bewildered and um i had a couple of difficult matches when i started to play we have like a team system here where i play in a team uh, we just got promoted actually so this year is is, is good for me because we're playing against some very high standard players but most of my problem is in training like you, back to your question it's the comments i've made after losing matches which are my entirely my fault or, or like sort of pretend matches, you know, training matches. Um, and I I mean, even what really hit me is last two weeks ago I played, um, after playing against the best player in our club, and he's like um, a very strong sort of 5-0 player, I guess, level at, in America. Um, he is super consistent, you know, he, he wins all the time. And I played against him in practice sets where we were playing like a tie break. And our matches go on forever like the the exchange is long you know it's good to watch and everybody else in the club is watching because their match is already finished and a couple of guys after the match even came up to me and said wow you really do play better against better players and i'm like oh no <laughs> like, what is it? that's like them admitting that they're not a better player and that's why i struggle and i'm thinking wow i'm such a you know can't say the word because it's sorry uh, that I would even put that out there, you know, like I just don't, and I have a coach, he's a good guy, he's a friend of mine, and he said to me from the beginning, you got all the shots, we just need to work on your consistency because you make a few too many mistakes, and on playing the game, so he calls it playing the game, and I'm, I'm kind of, like, I don't know what that means, you know, I, I just follow the rules, <laughs> when I was a kid, I don't know how to do it, it was natural when I was young, and, and now as an adult, these guys that are coming, these like, wily old foxes that can kind of outsmart you. I've got no idea what to do about against that. And I just realized that I've, I've let so many comments slip out that are just shameful, you know? And I really don't mean it. Like, the reason it hurt so much 
and the realization hit me so hard is because I really don't want to be condescending or arrogant. I, I would say that I'm not, you know, in general. But definitely, I've, I've, in the heat of losing, said a few things here and there, which <laughs> the, the, the opponent just doesn't deserve, you know, like you said, they have played better than me for that 20 minutes or half an hour. And I need to accept that. And until I can do that, I'm not going to get over this problem and start making headway myself. So um, I want to sort of give respect to them where it's due because they've earned it. And uh, at the same time, try and figure out a way that I can better deal with that sort of situation in the future. Yeah, thank you so much um, for sharing that. A quick question for you. Mm -hmm. Have you ever watched your, at any point when you were a junior or now more recently as an adult, have you ever watched yourself play tennis on video? I've watched myself in training sessions. I've never watched myself in a match. Okay. I would like right. to. Yeah. Yeah. I, I highly, highly recommend it. it there's this it's super interesting. And by the way, I want to just acknowledge and like give you credit, Ben. I think what you're describing, what we're talking about, is a universal experience. This isn't like a you problem. <laughs> I know it, it's hit you relatively hard because just recently you recognized that it's there and you don't mm -hmm. like it and that's uncomfortable and you don't like sitting with that kind of realization and it, it doesn't make you feel like a, a good person. Um, but I think comparison is a very natural human thing. It's probably like a survivalist, you know, evolutionary thing where it's like, we're always trying to make um, sure like where we are in the hierarchy. I live on a small farm in Wisconsin, in the middle of nowhere. And we get to watch animals <laughs> day, like minute by minute, sort out like what is, like we got like 40 chickens. Like the, the whole like cliche pecking order thing. It's like a real mm. thing. Like there's a, there's a very clear, like clean hierarchy. We're always looking around to figure out, is he above me? Is she below me? Like, where mm. am I in this hierarchy? Mm -hmm. And if we don't have a very clear self image of like who we are as a player. And by the way, technique is part of it. Just to, just to like acknowledge technique is important. Like how you swing mm -hmm. the racket, how you move your body is critically important and is a factor in what level player you are. But there's also tactics and strategy and patterns. There's also fitness and conditioning and footwork. There is also mental toughness and resiliency, like ability to, mm -hmm. to deal with pressure and stress. And you have to like combine all of those things together to really arrive at like an ultimate ability level for the player. But since it's not very easy to pick apart all those other factors and it's very easy to watch one swing from somebody on the other side of the net and be like oh i see what they're working with and you we immediately like categorize you know people mm -hmm. and i think um the more we allow ourselves to do that kind of subconscious like knee-jerk thing and the worse mm -hmm. our own self-awareness is about how we uh rank in all of the different like categories are the more and more we're going to have these like experiences of uh, like defensiveness and anger and um, judgmentalism, condescension, because like what just happened, what just happened on the court does not match up with like what we, the one little sliver of category that we're judging our opponent based on and the crappy like self-awareness that, that we have. Sorry, I just talked mm -hmm. for a while. Does that, any of that uh, resonate or, or make sense? Yeah. Yeah, it touches on a few things that I've made notes about in preparation for our conversation today. Um, one of them is in general for me, I've so having taken such a long break from tennis, I'm a very different person coming back to it 20 years mm -hmm. later. But I love the fact that tennis completely rem takes me back to the same feelings I had as a, as a kid. You know, if you start playing in some bigger tournaments and people are watching or maybe even not many people but your parents are there or something which is important to you right and you just feel like if it doesn't go your way i, I want to get in the fetal position on the floor and just have the earth just eat me up you know like i just don't want to be there anymore. <laughs> and stepping out onto the court as a 40 year old man i'm thinking like really you're in this position still like you've learned nothing in the last 20 years because it just triggers exactly the same thing and i thought wow that's fantastic my battle was then okay i just want to feel free 
to play my game, you know, like without having these nerves and and all the stuff that's associated with it. I just want to be free to play. I just want to swing my racket and hit my shots, win, lose, or can't draw, but win or lose, I don't care. I just want to be able to do that. Uh, and I started to get to that level where I felt freer to swing out, you know, to like attack that ball and, and chase that down and, and all those sorts of things. And as well as working with the coach, right, him giving me a few tips saying, this is where you, this is the decision to make in that moment, right? And I'm, it works, things started to work and it almost made the situation worse because as I started to play better, <laughs> my opponents started to give me even more junk. And I'm like, because they're struggling, right? Then like naturally, like you just knock it back any which way you can when you're under pressure, which to be expected. And and that sort of exacerbated the problem even more because if they were in a, a point like that, where they felt like they were on the, on the back foot and they come out somehow on top, that's such a huge mental boost for them and such a, a sort of kick when you're down for me. And uh, there were huge momentum swings because of, you know, I did everything right. The point went exactly how I wanted it to go. And I just didn't execute on one killer shot or something. Or I went for too much because they're like laying on the floor, completely exhausted. <laughs> and I, I knock it out or in the net because, you know, I tried to smash it to pieces and it's not necessary. Um, yeah. And then and then the huge swing happens in the match. And I think that, that that's that's almost made the problem worse as I've got better because I don't have this mindset or I don't have this sort of, it's like it's not even in my awareness that there's another way than just hitting hard or, or worrying about your technique. But the other thing was um, what you just mentioned. I think it ties in very well with me uh, and this might be something very personal. I don't know if, if there's something other people can relate to, but um, feeling kind of accepted or valued, uh, it highlights to me that I have this problem that, that like losing to somebody where I don't feel like I should have poten potentially means they'll reject me. It's like, I'm not good enough and, and I'm scared because mm -hmm. I need to be loved. I need friends, you know, like help me. And when, like you said, right, when you're not sort of within yourself strong and, and you're safe in your own being, then there's a lot on the line every time you step onto the court in a club where you're trying to fit in. Like, I mean, I don't live in England where I grew up anymore. So I've changed location. I live now in Europe, in Austria, and I'm trying to integrate into a new club, into a sport. I haven't, you know, I don't know how it works here so much. So for me, it triggers all of these things. Like, I really want to be liked, you know, let me in. And and the poor guys in the club have done nothing wrong. You know, they're perfectly friendly and welcoming. <laughs> I'm like the crazy one with these issues. And uh, I think, that, that has a lot to do with it. And then the final thing I would say in response from what you just said, um, losing in a situation where you, you really don't feel like you should have. And in my situation where I just, I turn back to like technique or fitness and I'm like, my technique is great. My fitness is fantastic. You know, there's this hole and I can't fill it. And that, that's when these condescending, arrogant kind of thoughts and feelings come out. And I'm like, whoa, but there's nothing else for me to put in that hole until I saw your video and I was like, ah, I'm missing something here, something big, something these guys all know that I've completely ignored. And uh, so, yeah, I think that resonates with me a lot and, and in different ways, you know, in those three different ways in particular. I want to acknowledge something you just said that I think is actually very true. And you you said it, but you might not really believe it because you're, you're probably so uncertain of like everything right now <laughs> as you're like <laughs> reflecting on this and trying to figure out like, like who am I and like how good of a player am I really, you know, all these kind of like existential uh, mm -hmm. questions. And I want to acknowledge that what you achieved from age 10 to 20, as you went through that programming of high performance training and practice and traveling and tournaments and physical, you know, fitness and training, all that. Most humans never had that opportunity. Mm -hmm. And I, at first, maybe this is going to make you feel worse. So I'm sorry, you know, initially, <laughs> um, but most people really, truly never had that chance to play at that level and to experience like you, you talked about having that experience of kind of being in like the zone or like a flow, you know, kind of state where everything feels like free and like natural. Very few people ever get to experience 
that at a high level of execution. And so in a way, in a very real way, that really does make it harder for you. <laughs> now, when you go and play like normal everyday tennis players and they actually give you trouble because of all the other traits that they have that are totally legitimate and they've developed over decades of work and, and their own style of training, it might be different than what you did. But on the surface, it's easy for people to minimize their path because it wasn't a socially accepted, like high level version of getting good at tennis. We all view, you know, we watch TV, we watch professional players, the men and women who are like super elite, you know, crazy athletes. And we view, we put that on a pedestal and view it as like, that's what I'm trying to achieve. Whether I'm a beginner or an intermediate player, we kind of like look up at them and we're like, that's good tennis. Like that, that's like real tennis is, is the way that they play it. And you tasted like a little piece of that when you were a junior competitor traveling <clears throat> and uh, competing in tournaments. And so <clears throat> it, I, I just want to like acknowledge directly to you. It totally makes sense that it would be actually harder for you to kind of come back down to earth and figure out how do I spar and uh, tangle with these everyday athletes that might not have the pedigree and they might not have the polish, they might not have the aesthetic that you were used to seeing when you were competing at a pretty high level, but they still win a lot. And that's that's a hard like um, psychological thing to to sort out. And so don't feel bad that you're you're dealing with it a little bit. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Yeah, I think there's something um, to add as well in my particular case, which is a little bit unique. When I decided to leave uh, England after studying and, and working a little bit, I went on a bit of a jaunt, you know, traveling around the world. And I ended up being uh, an, a ski instructor, but a, a ski instructor of ski instructors. So I was somebody who would um, train and grade ski instructors to take more qualifications. At first, I went through the qualifications myself. And then I helped train people to do the same thing, you know, to become better so that they could teach better clients. and. And I really understand a lot about coaching. I've studied it for a long time. I love it. I love teaching things. Uh, I think it's brilliant. But when I look at that period of time, for about 10 years or so, I did nothing but focus on my technique in a sport and my fitness because I needed to be fit because I was training before work, working a full day and then training after work and then going to the gym. So it was a, a full program that I gave myself, right? Like no one to blame but myself. Um, but I had to take part in races and I had to do sort of filmed runs where people are judging you and you know, there's, you can see the judges and you can see the terrain that you're about to ski down and it's tricky and they're asking you to do something tough. Uh, and all you had to go back on was technique. So I was obsessed and everybody in my shoes was obsessed with it, right? It was like a complete and unhealthy obsession with technique because it was the answer. There was no opponent. Um, even if you're in a race, right, you're racing one at a time. There's no opponent there trying to make your life difficult as you ski through the gates. Hmm. And um, then when I switched out of that mode and I decided to leave the skiing world behind as a profession, at least, and now I just enjoy going for a ski, right? Um, when I try and get back into tennis, I carry that with me. And the thing is, that was successful. I was good at what I did and I loved it. And that really worked. So like, that's kind of my wheelhouse. And when that doesn't work, that's when that hole is sort of getting bigger and bigger. And you're like, what is the answer here? What do I fill this hole with? And that's unfortunately, I think, capitulated the problem even, even further, which for somebody who hadn't lived, you know, lived in a ski resort for 10 years nonstop, uh, probably wouldn't have such a, such a heavy bias towards the technique side. But uh, I mean, it's not an excuse. I don't want to make any excuses. It's just something which I think when I look back over the years, that has definitely not helped my current situation. I want to I want to push back a little bit on something you just said. You said that you had like an obsession over technique and that mm -hmm. it worked and it, you know, it gave you results. And mm -hmm. and so for that reason, you kind of feel um, like, oh, I should probably keep going back to that, you know, approach because yeah. it, it gave me pretty good results. What if you could have had even better results by spreading your focus a little bit more evenly across 
the other traits that were important to your outcome of like how well you did on the ski hill and obviously tennis too but it sounds like you know with the judges and like no direct like competition stuff like that i understand like it's skewing things you know more towards the technical but if you're honest about it it was more than just technique right like the the outcome it was technique maybe it was more heavily weighted but had you spread your um had you spread your focus and spread your awareness across maybe a little bit more balanced um, cross section of the sport, maybe you could have actually even done better. Is that fair? Yeah, I mean, there's there's normally these ski ski exams, especially as you, I mean, consistently throughout the whole period, there are kind of like very technical runs where nothing else matters. It's very sort of um, very demonstrative what you're supposed to show uh, for a guest. Gotcha. And then there are other runs which are like free runs, more high speed runs where you have to perform in very terrain, in very conditions, and you just have to perform. It's all about performance. Now, obviously, you can't have rubbish technique. You have to be doing the right movements in order to perform, but the performance is key. And me and my friends that went through this system all together, we kind of focused very heavily on the technique side and the feedback was given to us many times. Stop training, go out in the rain or in the rubbish snow when it doesn't make any sense <laughs> get in the trees and and do silly things make do jumps you know ski the bumps when there are rocks in there and stuff and you have to all of a sudden react and jump over a rock or something which you didn't expect to be there we they want because we didn't ski as kids right so we started skiing as adults or at least i did uh, and i had i had missed exactly what i now have in tennis I, you know that in sort of innate sense of you know, I just flick my wrist this way or I bend my knee that way uh, without thinking about it and I'll get the desired result. So I didn't have that in skiing and it was prevalent all the way throughout my uh, exams. And I scored well, but, you know, it, they. Uh, my feedback was that I could have done better had I have let go and just go and experience, just go and be. And, um, yeah, I think, I think that's a fair comment that, you know, my obsession with technique served me well, but it was definitely not the only route, or maybe not even the fastest route, we'll never know. So what's hard on the tennis court is the, uh, a comparison there with like the skiing and like going into the trees and rocks and like bad snow and stuff like that is playing those awkward opponents, right? Like the, the person mm -hmm. who's like a pusher, like a defensive player, or um, just it. uses a lot of different spins and like a uh, drop shot yeah. lob and like stuff like that. Yeah where we feel like, oh, th these conditions, it's not good. Mm -hmm. But I, I completely agree, like just to borrow, you know, from the skiing like example, that's where growth, you know, really happens. If mm -hmm. you are secure enough and you're open-minded enough to take the lessons. But if you're not very secure and you're not very open-minded, then all of those mm -hmm. little jagged edges and all those little micro like challenges now all of a sudden we have to build some kind of defense like mechanism to explain to ourselves like why we're having such a hard time in these difficult uh, conditions. Mm -hmm. And I think that's when tennis players start to get into trouble is when mm -hmm. instead of being self-reflective and saying, what lesson can I learn from this? They put up a shield and say, they're garbage. Like they don't yeah. have like the skills that they should have. And so Therefore, I shouldn't yeah. be held to like, a good standard and that's when things Absolutely. get really toxic mm -hmm. yeah that's totally true and that's so, what i'm trying to do right ahead, like it's I'm trying, to, I'm trying to address the situation in a positive way because i've seen that what i've been doing until now it just doesn't work it's destructive it doesn't work it doesn't i don't feel i don't feel good about it I'm sure my team members are like, why well, sometimes he's such a nice guy, but sometimes he's a real ass, you know, or whatever. I'm sure they've had conversations like that. Um, but, you know, it's like there's no hiding from it. So I, I want to kind of address it, but I want to turn it into a positive and, and not shy away from it. Uh, I think it's I think it's important. And it's like the, the adjust, like you say, the adjustment you need to make or the, the sort of what you do when conditions aren't quite right. It's It's somehow like playing freely is great and playing my game is great but when nothing is coming as expected i mean it doesn't often happen that nothing comes but when yeah next to nothing comes the way that you want it then um you need to find something else right it's like knowing how to win 
or at least even if winning isn't the be all and end all, it's knowing how to perform and come off the court feeling I did all right, you know, I gave it my best, you know, on those days where nothing's really on your side, it seems. And I think it was quite tricky because I came back to tennis, played with a few friends, you know, like just a friendly, not just purely, just, just because. And I was really astounded. Wow, I can still do this. Like I've had a massive break and I'm still right there. I can still pull off these shots that I, I don't think about and intuitively it comes and I just pull it off. And obviously there's a huge consistency issue and all that sort of stuff. But um, it wasn't, I wasn't a million miles away, but so I got back in really quick and in the training and in, in uh, initial training before I started trying to take this a bit more serious, I was performing great. And it was just like, wow, now actually openly saying to the world, you know, like I play tennis, that's what I do. I love it. I want to play more and I want to be better. Now making any forward progress is almost impossible. It feels like, you know, it's like, wow, that's, that's different. The learning curve was so quick up until now. And now it feels like it's <laughs> totally plateaued and I have to fight for every inch. And I'm hoping that, I, you know, the identification of this area, this, this missing area in my game is going to help me make a few quick yards, you know, because I need to, I don't need to do anything, but like, I feel like I need to get back on. I, I want to compete at my level, you know, I don't want to be 60 when I first figure it out. And then my level is terrible and uh, I can't compete at a good level anyway. You know what I mean? While I still can, I want to give it my best shot. So that's what I'm trying to yeah. do. <clears throat> well, a uh, quick, quick personal story. And I'll tell you what I feel like has been the biggest um, impact for me personally. I hit a wall in my tennis when I was 20, no, 21. I was 21 at the time. And my relationship with the game became super toxic and as a teenager and like an adolescent, tennis was like the most important thing in life to me. It was kind of a life raft for me. And it was like the thing that brought me the most happiness and like enjoyment in life. And I got onto my college team. I was the weakest player on the team. I walked on my, my second year. Wasn't good enough to make the team my, my first year of uh, college. And by the end of my third year of playing on the team, I hated tennis and it was like miserable for me. And I was so angry and so um, frustrated minute by minute. Even the matches that I won, I, I walked off angry. But the matches I lost were, were like just soul destroying. And I just went down this negative like uh, spiral and... Um, so I, I ended up actually quitting my, my college uh, team my senior year. like this, And that really scared me because I had every intention of making tennis like my lifelong like, career. And so I kind of had this big existential you know, crisis myself at that age asking the question, why has this become destructive? Why, why is it making me so unhappy when it used to make me happy? And so that was 20 years ago now. And looking back, I think the solution for me now I play matches that frankly have much bigger implications. Um, you know, back when I was playing in college or like as a junior, maybe 10 people would be watching me or like 20, you know, at the most. And mm -hmm. now 10, 20, a hundred thousand people might, <laughs> might watch my match and tennis is my career now. So there's like, there's a lot of like implications like wrapped up in, whether I win or I lose or like who I win against or who I lose against. And I'm so grateful to be able to say that I'm able to play with total freedom now. I mean, mm -hmm. honestly, and I enjoy it more than I ever have before, even though the stakes are, are much higher. And I think there's two reasons why I've been able to do that. And hopefully this resonates with you a little bit and, and people out there. Reason number <laughs> one is a, is a much more accurate perspective on tennis as a whole. Uh, when I was 17, 18, 19, I didn't understand yet um, how wide and deep the game of tennis was. And so I couldn't fully appreciate what I could do or not do on the court. And so in the moment, I, I had this really 
toxic attitude of, <clears throat> I should be able to figure this out and win and be successful and triumph no matter what the challenge is, like yeah. on the other side of the, of the net. Yeah. Maybe that resonates with you a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I didn't yet understand how big and deep of a problem that I was trying to solve. I had a very shallow perspective of what tennis was. And the second thing that I didn't understand yet was a, a wide and deep understanding of myself and who I was really actually like as an athlete. And I didn't come to really understand that until I watched myself play enough tennis and I had enough experiences that I was curious enough about figuring out the answer. Like why, why did I lose, lose to this person? Why did my forehand totally disappear for like a month, you know, over here. And it wasn't until I got a deeper understanding of the game of tennis and a deeper understanding of myself so that I could accurately see where I fit in, in the big picture. It wasn't until I started to be able to clearly see who I was and who tennis was that I could actually be content and happy no matter what the outcome was. Mm -hmm. And um, I think the more your vision is clouded by, uh, the more your vision is clouded as to what those things are. And especially when you sprinkle in their competitiveness, uh, that's just like a explosion, like waiting to happen. So, uh, that's my quick story. Um, any uh, like thoughts, reactions uh, to that? Yeah, I think I hope that people can relate to that because I don't. It doesn't sound like when I hear you say things like that. It it doesn't sound at all strange. I don't think that's because it's describing me particularly a hundred percent. But it just sounds like a normal person talking about normal things, you know. And it's just wrapped up in this game of tennis. And for me, I think I'm totally still trying to figure out what tennis is. I've got no idea. And uh, since leaving tennis and coming back to tennis, I'm a totally different person. I feel like I know who I am now, like compared to when I was young. How do you know when you're young? Nobody knows when they're young, right? So that's okay. I'm totally fine with that. But this tennis, who, who the hell is this tennis guy? Like, what is this? I think I still need to learn that. And uh, I, I hope that's the journey that I'm taking my first steps on by having this conversation with you. How do you um, how do you explain that to the people watching and to yourself? How can it be that you pursued tennis for a decade at at the time a very you know a very very high level like higher level than ninety nine percent of people who ever watch this video are ever going to experience? How is it that you had so much insight and like help and guidance from good coaches and sounds like your parents like invested a lot of money like uh, and drove you you know around and flew you around like to play tournaments and stuff? How is it that you still don't know who this tennis uh, person is? I mean, I would say for context, um, I was quite lucky when I was a child um, that I was able to do that. I'm, uh, I'm aware that that's like not all, not all people have the um, ability to have so many lessons. I was also quite lucky in the sense that the local tennis club, I don't really know how they did it, but we got like deals with suppliers, you know, like I had Penn Sports back in the day. It's an old company. I don't even know if they still exist. I had them supply me with clothes and a bag. And I had Mizuno rackets and, and I didn't pay for any of that stuff. And I'm pretty sure I didn't pay for all of my lessons. I don't know how this works, but like uh, my parents did a lot of driving around to and from lessons. And then the tournaments were handled all by the club themselves. And I'm super grateful for it. You know, like it was a real great experience and, um, I think it's really good to learn as a child so that you can then fall back on it as an adult and hopefully have some fun. But on the other hand, at that age, I don't think I really knew what I had at all. You know, like I didn't, I didn't appreciate it because I had no comparison. Like, um, I mean, I did appreciate it. Don't get me wrong. I don't want to seem like a spoiled little kid. I don't have tons of money. My family's not super affluent, but, you know, I just was lucky in the sense that I could play a lot of tennis. And I think they really went out of their way for people who, who tried hard, you know? Like, so there were some families who were just there because, you know, tennis is what you do. Uh, you know, and that wasn't me. And I was kind of like the kid who rode his bike to and from there when my parents could take me. So, like, they saw my commitment was there, even, even if uh, I didn't have the money to back it up all the time. But because of that, I just got kind of swept along 
and went with a fly, like a lot of my friends as well, similar sort of background. Like I remember some really, really good players um, who didn't make it because they weren't from the right background, who went through my club at some stage. And um, we were we were mates, you know, we just played all the time and they were a lot better than me. I think they were a lot better than me. They, you know, they were pushing hard and being around them, having them take me with them helped me a lot. I think in, in, I just thought that was normal. I just thought this is what happens. You know? <laughs> yeah. And um, yeah, we, we, I just got stuck in. I just went for it. Every, every match that I had the opportunity, I was trying to play my game and hit my shots. And if it was good enough, I'd win. And if it wasn't, I wouldn't. And, uh, and that's why now I still don't know what to do when it's not good enough. I don't, I mean, I <laughs> some strategy, you know, I've, I've been doing my homework. I've, uh, I bought your book and, uh, I also read, um, the inner game of tennis from Tim Galway. I much preferred that to, to winning ugly, which another, a friend of mine recommended I read, um, I, I resonate much better with the, with Tim's approach and, and with what you'd said in your book, you know, like standard things like hitting cross, unless there's a real good reason not to things like that. You know, like rock solid, you can fall back on that. And I have some tactics that I am trying to employ depending on who my opponent is, if I know who it is in advance. Um, but once plan A doesn't work and plan B, maybe if I'm so well prepared that that doesn't work either, I have a plan B and it doesn't work. I'm at a loss, you know, I'm just lost. And <laughs> I can't quite explain how I don't know what tennis is at this stage <laughs> in my life, but, um, I can only say that I just got swept away. The, the tennis club was like my family, you know, like I, I, they were everything, like my friends and we would go everywhere together. We'd do everything. It was, it was everything. And I didn't stop to think and I didn't need to. They just, it just kept rolling. And I just going until I, you know, moved away, went to uni, made a few choices, like life choices. What do I want to do? Which direction do I want to go? And I had no idea. So I just tried to not close too many doors and leave as many options open for afterwards thinking, well, once I've done this, I'll probably know, still don't know, but you know, doing my best. And, uh, yeah, I, I find myself in this rather unbelievable position that I have no idea. So, uh, yeah, open for help and suggestions from any of <laughs> <laughs> me all about. My honest internal response to hearing that statement is I'm so jealous that at age 40, whatever you are, you get to begin that journey now and have yeah. all the like experiences and all the revelations. You get to have all the like breakthroughs and epiphanies of finding out what this tennis thing is. And I, looking back over my, I've been in the game for 30 years now and I'm so grateful that I've had that growth, you know, journey uh, through mm -hmm. the game. It's taught me so much about life and about myself. And you might have been like on autopilot for those 10 years, but you came away with it with a lot of incredible habits and relationships and stories and uh, life experiences. And now at age 42, you get to now with a very, you know, much more, um, hopefully, you know, developed like uh, mind and like awareness of like yourself and the rest of the world. Now you get to dive like into the deep end of the game and find out like, what is this thing exactly? And at times, of course, that's going to bring you frustration and like, you're going to be beating yourself up about um, how, how is it possible? I can't like figure this out. And I, uh, how is it possible? Like I lose to this player. Like I, you're going to be tempted to like, think back to how well you used to play back in the day and how automatic it probably was. But I would really encourage you to just kind of flip that script in your head and align it towards like gratitude for it, being able to now have that learning and growth like experience because there's so many adults that are, right. I'm about, ugh, how old am I? Yeah. I'm, I'm about to be 43. Uh, I'm 42 also. There's so many adults at our age, Ben, that are just going through the motions. They wake up every day, they go to a job they hate because they have to, because they've got a mortgage and car payments and kids, and they don't have the, this outlet of like personal growth and development and experience 
because they just don't make the time to be able to pursue something as deep and wide as tennis and challenge themselves in that way. And so like in a nutshell, we have the choice every day to either let our ego take over and complain and blame the other person and be condescending, or we have the choice to be like, damn, this is such an incredible opportunity I have in front of me to learn about myself and learn about the world and learn about um, this amazing game. It's a huge opportunity. Yep. I mean, at 42 now, I have a son. He's six. Um, um, you know, my wife and I, um, she doesn't play tennis. So she's just getting started. She's sort of wondering what it, all this fuss is about that I keep making. <laughs> and, uh, um, I see it like there's so many synergies that the development I'm trying to do in tennis mirrors the opportunities I have in front of me with my family that I can mm. instill this in him. So that he understands it and doesn't have to, at 42, try and yeah, <laughs> right, on this epic voyage. <laughs> you know, like, I just kind of think it's a, it, yeah, I mean, what, what else can I do? You know, like it, there's a hole in, in my understanding here and I have the chance to work on it. So I think bringing it into awareness is for me, for sure, the first thing. And then trying to share that with all of my friends and family and, especially the ones closest to me, you know, to try and be maybe potentially benefit them one day in the future. It's, there's just no, no reason not to, although it's scary and, you know, it's going to mean taking lots of long, hard looks at myself after losing match point or whatever, you know, it's, uh, <laughs> it's just going to be one of those things, but, um, yeah, it, it's, it's gotta be done. Right. Because I think as well, like for the people is not in my position, somebody who doesn't perhaps have years of training behind them and and just spent years grinding and grinding and getting through it and and now are really competent players with good ratings and fantastic track records those guys are having so much fun like they're having a whale of a time like beating idiots like me some of them think that not, great, not you know? all of them you, there there's plenty there's plenty of players at your level or above that also hate themselves <laughs> like that that happens too but yeah of course yeah. there's there's always going to be a spectrum yeah. there in terms of people's relationship with themselves and, and with the game mm -hmm. so i want to get some of that fun i want to have some fun yeah and, and and i like the way that my my friend who helps coach me a little bit he says uh we're just going to play the game you've got to work on playing the game and i'm like wow they're just calling it a game instead of calling it like a technique exercise <laughs> you know like his uh is is a is a change of approach so i'm i'm really hopeful that i have these epiphanies that you talked about like you said you're jealous of what's coming i hope that there's something coming you know like i hope that i'm on the right path or I'm, I, I take the right steps I, I don't really know which way to go from here so it's all a bit of an open book but um at least i've at least i've opened it you know at least i haven't shut it yeah firmly and and ignoring it now i feel very confident you're headed in the right direction um not at all to make light of, you know, addiction or like the 12 step, you know, kind of process. Step one is admit you have a problem. <laughs> and just the <laughs> fact that we're, we're having this conversation and um, you've had this, uh, this eye opening uh, reflection uh, just for a brief period now. But if, if you continue grabbing onto that curiosity and like desire um, to have a healthier relationship with the game i'm sure I'm, it will it will come i'm very i'm very confident of that uh well, ben i want to be res respectful of your time um i've really enjoyed this conversation any kind of final um thoughts or maybe messages for whoever it is that if some crazy person is still going to be listening you know to the end of this i don't know how many but um <laughs> uh i i've enjoyed this conversation a lot but it's obviously only for a certain you know type of person who kind of wants to reflect on these things. These are not, we were talking before we started recording. These are not the sexy, you know, topics that is going to bring in a whole lot of uh, listeners or, or viewers, but um, any final thoughts for yourself or maybe messages for um, audience before we sign off? I think the only thing that I would like to say is uh, before the conversation, since watching your video and before we started recording this conversation, uh, the, the topic hasn't let me rest, you know, like it's been whirling around in my head repeatedly and I keep having ideas. I was making notes, you know, I was trying to prepare as best I could uh, and I was worried. I was nervous, you know, like it's it's not it's 
it's not so easy to talk about all the time. And now, after having spoken to you about it, it was nowhere near as difficult as I thought it was. Like, it, it totally wasn't. It, I mean, it, a lot of credit to you because although this is the first time we've ever spoken, it's super easy to talk to you. you it's very, you know, not not difficult, not, you know, there's no blockages, there's nothing in the way. So um, thank you for that, for helping me this far in this conversation. And for anybody else, I would encourage them to also take a look at it, uh, the issue, and say that it's not as tough. After you've started that first step, it's not as mm -hmm. tough hopefully, as you think. And if it continues along this way, and it's as easy for the rest of the journey, I'm sure it won't be always, but uh, it's not as bad as you think. So I would encourage everybody to try and, and do that same same sort of process. They just need to have a conversation with you. Yeah, that's all. I'll I'll, I'll open my schedule up. <laughs> I'm sure yeah. I'm sure I'd have a lot of uh, a lot of takers. Um, yeah. Well, yeah. Let me address that real quick. Um, I, I I I hope my I didn't make my story sound like I've reached some kind of ultimate en enlightenment where like I no longer have frustrations or like anger like on the court or anything like that. The difference is now I still get frustrated. I still get angry, but, but there, I can see and I can feel the purpose behind why I'm struggling with that situation or whatever the, whatever the challenge is, you know, I'm not playing well, or my opponent just hit this ridiculous, you know, shot and they're celebrating. Like I, I still have, I'm still human, right? So like the, the feelings and the emotions are always going to be there. I'm always going to be very competitive and want to win no matter who I'm playing against. But now, after the journey that I've been through, I'm able to fit it in to the bigger picture and very quickly reset and come back to a, a position of balance. And mm -hmm. the very next point, I might get frustrated again, yeah. but I'm, I'm, I'm able to reset now, whereas in the past... It was just a constant, continual negative spiral of like just pulling me like down into this like negative space. And the more you open yourself up to this journey and just keep asking the questions that you're asking, Ben, I'm super, super confident that you're going to have more and more of those experiences where, where you look up after something really unfortunate has happened on the court and five seconds later, you're able to smile and go back to just doing whatever it is that you need to do to play your best tennis. I'm really confident that you're going to experience that.